hello, my name is Marnie and I'd like to welcome you to Franklin City Library's Frank Talk with Heather Morris. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Frankston City Libraries operates, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement and respect to the elders of other communities who may be joining us today. Now, following on from the huge international success of her two novels, The Tattooist of Auschwitz and Silka's Journey, New York Times bestselling author Heather Morris now shares her own story and explores the art of listing in her first non-fiction book. Especially in this uncertain time, Stories of Hope provides inspiration and tools for anyone who is keen to deepen their connections to others by enhancing, enhancing their listening skills. Heather, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you. Absolute pleasure to be kind of back in Frankston. Uh, you're actually outside my 25k zone, so maybe I shouldn't be talking to you just yet. Oh, maybe, I mean, do they know? Does Dan know? Can he see us? <laughs> it was so lovely to host you earlier in the year for the launch of Silken's yeah. Journey for our chat there. But now we're talking about stories of hope. So what compelled you to write your first non-fiction book? Well, first of all, it was not a pandemic, okay, folks? Um, I wrote this before COVID reared its ugly head. Though when you read the, the book, and if you so choose to, in the very beginning, you'll read a, a small introduction there that I subsequently wrote just before the book went to the printers, where I acknowledge what a shit of a year we had in 2020. And um, I'm, I'm referring mostly just to us here in, in Australia, and I re reference the bushfires and the floods, and of course, then the pandemic came along. So I do acknowledge it, but rest assured this book was not a frantic attempt to capitalise on, on a pandemic. Why did I write it? How did I write it? Yeah, yeah, look, I actually love telling why this book came about. It says a little bit more about me. And by the way, this is not a memoir. You're not going to get to know everything there is to know about me, but you will learn a little about me and my upbringing and my success and or failures as a parent. But... Oh, it was before Silka came out. I was in Koshita in Slovakia with my publisher from London, Margaret. She's a fellow Kiwi, and she'd accompanied me to Koshita to go and visit people who knew Silka, her friends and neighbours, so that we could finish writing her story. And one particular day, she and I met with a whole group of people in the apartment building where Silka had lived for over 40 years. We were in the apartment right next door to the one that Silka and her husband had lived in and owned. Uh, in fact, I had gone into that apartment and been in there with the new owners. But there were probably about a do throughout the day, about a dozen people at a time came into this lounge room of 93 and 96 year old Mr. and Mrs. Samuelie. And I had two translators with me. I speak no Slovakian other than Jacquem, which is thank you. And none of these are people, the friends and neighbors spoke any English. So Margaret, my publisher, and I are there, two translators. These beautiful, beautiful people from Koshita, once they met me, within minutes, they are talking to me and telling me all they knew about Silka. It just opened up. And I'm just looking at them. My poor translators are working 10 to the dozen. And I never look at my translators when I'm working with them. They're off to the side to me. And I focus on the person who's talking to me. And we did this for several hours and people came and went. Now, later on that night, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, my family used to call me not a storyteller, but a bullshit artist. And you're starting to work out why, aren't you? But um, later on that night, after dinner, my publisher and I, Margaret and I, we looked around the hotel we were staying at in Koshita. There's not many there. And it had a bar we saw downstairs in the dungeon. Oh, let's go down there and have a coffee and a drink. Now, Margaret made the observation to me while we were having a port or two or three that when she had asked a question during the day to these people that we were sitting talking to, they pretty much ignored her. She said, I was just watching them interact with you, a perfect stranger, and yet they're pouring their heart out and you're just sitting there listening and hearing them. You're not making notes. You're just engaged with them. And I went, uh-huh, yeah, that's what I do. She said, how did you learn to do that? And even with a couple of ports under my belt, I knew that the way and the reason that I could sit and listen to people was because I learned how to do that with my great-grandfather. 
And I just casually said, oh, Gramps taught me how. Great grandfather. He lived two paddocks away from me growing up in rural New Zealand. And uh, he was the only person in my life when I was growing up, or the only adult who I thought ever not only listened to me, but actually spoke to me, told me things, shared his life with me. None of that was happening in, in the home where I lived with my parents and four brothers. Uh, no listening going on there at all. But um, yes, every afternoon after school, I would stop off and spend time with Gramps. And she, just, Margaret just looked at me and she said, oh my God, you have to write that. And um, out of that, this whole book about, we call it Stories of Hope, but it's about how if you listen, you will hear these stories of hope but it's by shutting up and listening is how you learn. But that's how it came about in a bar in Koshita late at night that we subsequently got kicked out of. That, yeah, I have to say that would have to be the best story ever. <laughs> <laughs> and not the, the bar and kicked out of was the bit I wasn't expecting. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, now I am, I don't know whether to give this bit away or not. Yeah, um, it's the audiobook bit we were talking about earlier. So I chose to enjoy Stories of Hope on audiobook or talking book. And my surprise was when we entered Chapter 2. And I have to say, there were numerous times that I burst into tears while I was reading your book. But the first was entering Chapter 2 because I had read, it, it took me a while to get through Tattooist, um, you know, as you would agree. It, it is heavy content. Um, and I felt like the way you write, I was standing there with Lale a lot of the time and, and I struggled with that. Um, but to go into chapter two, and it's something you will not get reading the text of the book, you must also listen to the audio. But I got to hear Lale. And, I, and to be honest, Heather, I think that is one of the greatest gifts you have given us through mm -hmm. your writing and through your experience. What made you choose to include that recording? Because it was the only way that I can get you to actually hear his own voice and hear this beautiful man who I had in my life for three years. And that's part of what um, Stories of Hope is about also. That's where I get to tell people, or readers, all these little stories that I tell you when I talk to you about my time with Lolly. Because it seems that, and it makes sense when I talk to people now about his book, well, people don't want me to talk about the book. They've read the bloody thing. Move on. Now tell us something that we don't know. And so it seems to be there's a fascination with my relationship with him. And, uh, and, and, and writing about my relationship with him, it made perfect sense to me um, on the audio book. Well, how about people hear him? That was something I recorded. I've got a lot of recording of him, by the way. That was just a little excerpt of it. It was beautiful, Heather, and I thought it was so well placed um, before we went into the story about your relationship with Lale. Um, and given we were introduced to him in Tattooist, what was it like for you getting to know him and how important was active listening in being able to do that? Oh, it was paramount. I mean, I would not have been able to tell his story if I didn't. And um, what Marnie's referring to when she talks about active listening yeah, it's not a phrase that gets thrown around much because it's not something I think we do as much as we should. It makes perfect sense when we're with friends and family and company and we're talking that we're actually having a conversation. Now, when we're having that conversation, what we are doing is listening to what's being said so that we can respond. We're thinking about what our answer to what's being said before the person's even finished talking. Now, active listening is when you don't talk yourself. You actually do just shut up and listen and focus. And you're not trying to come up with a response. There is no place here for you to have an opinion. And you're doing that person you're listening to the greatest honour by just letting them talk. And I know that we get uncomfortable when there's a silence and um, all too often we feel the need to fill that. But I, I learned with Lully and with many, many other people who I've been now spent in time with, that if you just pause with them and you don't jump in to say something, it gives that, that encouragement for someone to keep talking if they're telling you something they want you to hear. Not talking about the weather, something somebody really wants to tell you. It's important. 
Now, 90% of our time, it's conversation. Active listening is not part of that, and that's just fine. But if you've got somebody in your life that, A, you'd like to hear something about them, you know that there's something remarkable may or may not have happened to them. If you've got a, um, a, a grandparent or a person in your life who you've seen a knickknack on their mantelpiece for years, walk past one day, pick it up and just say to them, hey, do you remember when you got this? You know, does it mean something to you? Because sure as hell it does. That's why it's been sitting on that mantelpiece for decades. And that is how you just engage yeah, with somebody and, and give them that chance to talk. Not all the time, but you will be the one that will be rewarded if, if you do it. Absolutely. And I think that is what I loved about this book. You know, while we've heard Lale's story and we've heard Silka's story, it was good to understand your interaction with them. And I did find when I was listening to the book, um, I was listening to stories you'd actually already told us um, when we met with you at the start of the year. And I think, oh, that's right. And it might be something else that you might have popped in that isn't in the book that I'd be like, but this happened. Or, you know, just something that was missing or, or maybe a joke you made on the night when we last spoke with you. So it was really nice to feel that intimacy around your writing in that book. Um, and I thought it was really important as well with your grandfather. Um, you actually said you never asked about an item either. You, you waited for him to talk to you about it, yeah. really making it all that bit more special. Yeah, he was actually my great-grandfather and a head actually in a New Zealand. And what was significant about him in terms of his youth, being a young boy, he actually found himself in South Africa in, in the Boer War. So that's how far back we're going with him. And as a 16-year-old boy there, he got uh, taken aside just when he arrived by, I think, what is he, general or whatever his title is, um, Kitchener, Lord Kitchener who was there in, in charge of the, the British Army and saw this young kid that arrived from New Zealand with his older brother. And so he spent his time in South Africa actually with Lord Kitchener as his boy, shall we say. But he picked up artefacts and he brought all these amazing things back from South Africa during World War times. And he would just every now and then I'd sit down with him and he'd already have something there just sitting between us on the little chair of his, um, ledge of his chair. And, and I knew just to look at it and look at it until he finally would just pick it up. Want me to tell you where I found that or where I got that? And it wasn't just from, from the ball, it was his whole life. And uh, yeah, but it wasn't only talking or listening to him as he talked about his life and about things. Many, many times when I said, what are you talking about today, Gramps? And he's actually, as to say, my great grandfather. He would um, sometimes just go, well, girly, we're just going to listen today. He called me the early. And by that he meant, let's just listen to what's going on around us. Now, more often than not, it was the sound of the dogs bringing the cows into the shed for milking. Um, or, or my mother, two paddocks away, we could still hear her yelling at one of my, or all of my four brothers. Or nothing, that simple nothing, a bird. Gosh, you could almost hear a leaf fall out there. And to him, that was important to just, Listen, it's not white noise. It doesn't become white noise if you're listening for it. It's white noise for us now in our busy lives. But yeah, that's the role that he played and he taught me how to do that. We should, yeah. I honestly think reading those chapters on your great-grandfather, I think you gave him just as much as he gave you. Look, look you're probably right. I've never really thought of it that way. But I know because I've got these brothers, you see, and um, I sent them a copy of the manuscript because they get mentioned in it, um, obviously. And it was interesting when you talk to your siblings as a mature adult, you realise that even though you grew up together, there were things that you um, did not know about the other. Now, my brothers, all they knew was they were jealous of my relationship with our great-grandfather and they knew that he only wanted to spend time with me. Um, and so, yeah, I guess he did for some reason pick me and they never knew half the stuff, or not even a tenth of the stuff I knew from him. But I also never heard him talking to the adults in my family. I mean, his, his own daughter, my grandmother, my mother, his granddaughter and other adults, never ever do I recall him talking intimately uh, with them. So I, 
maybe it was um, something cathartic for him to find someone to talk to, a bit like Lolly. You know, Lolly was roughly the same age when I met him. Mm. I wasn't. It was about 50 years between. <laughs> but um, <laughs> similar age. No, I would definitely agree that, yeah, I'm sure he processed a lot in being able to speak with you about those artifacts, artifacts and those times. Mm. Now, I think what I love most about Stories of Hope is that it is actually your story. It's, it's told from your point of view. And but what I also loved is that it provided an opportunity for you to rebut some of the comments that were made when you first published The Tattooist of Auschwitz. What impact did those negative comments to your novel, essentially, it, it wasn't meant to be nonfiction, um, your novel, and perhaps did it change or have an impact in the way you then went about writing Silka's journey? How, how did it impact you? And what did it mean for you be, to be able to acknowledge what had happened um, in Stories of Hope? It was really weird, Marnie. When just before um, Tattooist came out, my publishers and I spoke about the possibility of there being some criticism and we didn't know where it would come from, but we sure as heck knew that some would come. Hmm. And nothing did for a whole year. So when it did, it was like, pow, okay, what's going on here? I mean, the book was truly, well and truly out, and it was in multiple countries. And the, um, the areas which where it came from were from countries where the, it had been out for months, um, close to a year. So it caught us, well, caught me anyway, by surprise. But the impact on it, well, you know, you take a hit initially. And then I started thinking, I think, that the criticism is unfair, that I was being criticised for telling a Holocaust story, Mm. not the Holocaust story, and the the criticism that you shouldn't separate out one individual who survived that horrific period and make it about them. And there was a couple of factual things that Lully had Gita's number wrong. Well, she was tattooed twice. And so they just decided, oh, we'll skip over that because when she first came into Auschwitz, she was given a number. But when she moved six months later to Birkenau and her number had faded, you know, she was given another. But, you know, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, as they say. And and when it came to Silka, I knew that I'd possibly have trouble there too. But I thought, damn it, I'm again telling her story. Mm. I had the research from professional researchers in Moscow with regard to her time in the Volkuta Gulag. I went, as I said, to Koshita and spent time with friends and neighbours who knew her. Now, there was one thing that we thought that we were going to get really um, hammered with, and this is what sort of almost empowers me to um, go out now and talk about her, is fact and fiction and how the facts are considered to be sacrosanct and you don't get to mess with them. Well, here's a fact about Silka. We looked up, and we, anyone can, to all the Holocaust databases around the world. The biggest is Yad Vashem, the United States Holocaust database, uh, the um, Auschwitz Museum database. There's four biggies. And on every single one of them, we found Silka's name, Cecilia Klein, her date of birth, and, and the, her city of the town that she was taken from. No if, buts, or maybes, it was Silka. And on every single one of them was written the words, murdered in Auschwitz. So those factual databases said that she never survived Auschwitz. Mm. And I knew she had. I knew she had because, well, Gita used to visit her in Slovakia. And um, other the Auschwitz survivors I met here also talked about it. Oh, yes, yeah, Silka, this is what happened to her. And, yes, yeah, she was. She lived back in Slovakia. And then we clinched it when I was doing the research in Slovakia and the Slovakian authorities even let me come and see documents that I had no right to. You know, her birth details and marriage of her family and her dad and her sisters, birth, deaths and marriages all opened up to me. And when I looked at her birth registration, which is in a big book, um, beautiful 200 years worth of uh, births in this town of Sabinov all recorded. And there was Silka's, so Cecilia Klein, everything lined up. And at the end, we saw something written in a different pen in a different time. And to read there that on this day in 1958, Cecilia Klein returned to this office 
bringing with her the document from Bratislava, the government in Bratislava, declaring her to be alive and declaring her to be a citizen of the state of Czechoslovakia. So thank you, Silka. She made it known the only way she knew how by having her birth details amended. So fact, she's dead. Fiction, she's not. Other way around. Swap that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is that, you know, we got in touch with Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and we told them, look, we, we can prove that she actually didn't uh, die in Auschwitz. And they said, thank you. We appreciate hearing that. We will amend our database. Mm. So, yeah, you can take a hit and, um, and other stuff that come, but uh, I, I, I know I've done the right thing telling these girls stories, particularly Silkers. Absolutely. Uh, no, no, even lighters. But because in Silkers... And this is where I've also been criticised. It has raised the ugly spectrum, which has been washed away, buried under the rug. But now, actually, buried six feet down, and that is the sexual abuse of girls and women in times of conflict. And to then find out from the relevant bureaucrats, well, no, historians and academics, we don't talk about that. We don't mm-hmm. want to talk about that. Yeah, you know, we don't want to shame the women that it happened to. And I'm, for me, for all the wrong reasons for decades, uh, it had been denied that it happened. We're not denied, they just decided we wouldn't talk about it. Well, how shameful is that? And um, so, no, I'm I'm very happy to bring that out in the open, particularly when I'm in the US. It's a topic that uh, clearly a lot of people want to talk to me about. Absolutely. And I I think that's what I loved about Silka's journey um, was your notes attached to it, you know, which bits were true, which bits weren't, names that were changed to protect families, um, I must say I got to the end and I was like, no, I wanted that to be real. <laughs> but, yeah. I, but I love the fact that you said it is. You know, she did meet a, a man in um, the camp and fall in love and they lived together in the very apartment that I even sat in myself for over 40 years. That part, that part of her story was beautiful. And yeah. um, I also remember um, you talking about people not wanting to talk about the sexual assaults that take place at war and took place in World War II for it being over, overshadowing what happened to the Jews. But I think it needs to sit alongside it because they were Jews that it happened to, yeah. um, as well as civilians. So I, I think it's so important to really acknowledge everything that happened and all the atrocities as well as the positives that came out um, of people's stories um, and really have it, have it there for history so that it doesn't get repeated. Absolutely. And I totally understand why the murder of six million Jews is what the Holocaust wants to be in, in the forefront of, of all the, the studies with it. But how much easier is it to relate to the abuse of one girl during that time, um, as opposed to try and fathom the death of six million? You can't relate to six. I can't relate to the, uh, six million as a number. But also, we don't, we don't get to, to, to choose uh, what should and shouldn't be. Well, I don't think we do anyway. And when we tried to work out, well, why was it also not brought up? And we watched oh, dozens and dozens of testimonies, uh, video testimonies of Holocaust survivors, of women. And we found that the vast majority of them, these women, were being interviewed by men. And they sure as heck never asked the question. So to be able to, one of the criticisms of why are you bringing this up when there's no evidence of it? Uh, yeah, that's because you never bothered to ask. Exactly. And then you drill down the, um, the, the historians and they say, well, because you know, we don't want to shame the women for whom it happened to. It's our shame, guys. It's our shame. Not and then we know, we know from Silka's story, had they admitted to things like that, they would have then been persecuted as a result of it, even mm-hmm. though it was against their will. So rock and a hard place. Yeah, but um, never, ever use those words. They would just comfort women near me, guys. Yeah, no. No. I am curious to know, though, if you did get the opportunity to meet Silka, if she was still alive, what would you ask her? Look, I, I, I found out about her, tried to understand by meeting people who knew her in Slovakia, how did this 16-year-old girl have the kind of resilience and strength to be able to, to survive the horrors that she did? And I would just, to me, I really want to know from her Was she aware all the way along these horrific periods in her time that she just had to hang on for one more day? What was it every day that made her open her eyes? 
Um, what, where was the, the drive with her? Look, look, I know it wasn't her religion, okay? I can say that up front because from friends and neighbours who knew her, um, like Lully, uh, their, their, their religion took a hit, shall we say. So trying to fathom this young girl. But um, I think it was just that she was this incredibly strong-willed, stubborn, and I had that explained to me by a man in Badishoff about uh, who, who she was, the baby of the family, and she ruled the roost. So that was our Silka. Love it. Now, what are some of the surprising things that you've learned while writing your novels? Oh, the number of people who want to tell me about something else in their lives, which are not related to Holocaust necessarily, but who write to me and share with me very, very painful, traumatic events in their lives and feel for some reason that they can safely tell me this. And, and I'm really, really humbled that the people do this. And there are just some absolutely amazing, amazing emails I have. And that's also partly why Stories of Hope came about. In fact, we have a website. It's called Your Stories of Hope. And on that, uh, we encourage people to write a story of uh, something in their lives that has happened and where they have found hope to move on from it. And we have, that have been submitted to the publishers in England, amazing stories from people all around the world. Now, we are offering, or they're offering some of them editorial help to polish these stories up. They're just short stories. And um, I've read a couple of them out on a, a live Facebook event that I do every couple of weeks. And we're going to do something with all these amazing stories because they just all hang on that one word, hope. This happened in my life and I found hope from whatever. And uh, I'm just, that, that's been the thing that has come out of the books that so many people want to share their story of hope based on Lully and Silka's survival. Absolutely. And I, I really loved in Stories of Hope that you were able to bring in what I'll call your day job, um, which, of course, was assisting and supporting the social workers at a large Melbourne hospital, one of which, and excuse me, um, one of which I know people who have been in the neonatal ward. I know people who have been treated from breast cancer who recognised you on when we did see you back at the start of the year. You said, I knew I knew her face. Now I know where I know her from. I was being treated for breast cancer. So the impact you've had by being able to listen to people goes beyond the book, Stories of Hope, and people take that home with them. And I think for me, you know, while I was listening to the book and constantly crying at every new story because I'm an emotional wreck when I read books, um, but to me it was the blue and yellow marble. That, that got to me because I know people who have gone through similar events or who have almost gone through similar events but have come out on the positive side after 24-week pregnancies. So I'll say thank you on behalf of them oh, yeah. because I, I understand the impact you've had on them by being able to listen, not just writing your books but in your normal day-to-day, -day, being able to listen to people and make a difference to their life and help other people who make differences to people's lives. So thank you. Oh, look, you're welcome. And then that's all you can try and do in the, the role that I had at Monash. And uh, yeah, for nearly 20 years, I was involved in what they call the perinatal program. And that was assisting with parents um, who's, who lost a baby, either stillborn or a neonate death um, or, or a preterm, whatever. And yeah, thousands of people over those 20 years I've been involved with and I'd, I'd share one story, of course, it's, it's anonymous. I don't divulge who it was, but I do use one story out of that 20 years of working with these, these parents because, to me, there are no braver people on this earth than the parents who lose a child. Ah, to, to, to see them try and get through that and to know that if you just have a little tiny role with them, you can maybe make a difference. And part of my role was organising the, the monthly funeral service and managing that for them in, at Monash. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually get a little story from, from that, okay, but just the one. And it is beautiful. It is a beautiful story. Um, and it actually, I won't... I won't it's so funny, you know, doesn't it? We're talking about people who've lost a baby, but and this, and this couple did lose a baby, but it ties into a happy ending that for them two years later. 
Absolutely. And it occurred to me, you probably know my cousin, but we won't go into that right now because uh, she is a midwife in the in the oh. NICU unit there. So you've probably come across her at some point. 52 North or 52 South, one or the other. Yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> now tell me, I, I, I'm, I would like you to share your publishing story with us because The Tattooist of Auschwitz did not start as a novel. Do you want to walk us through where it started and how it ended up in book form and in my bookshelf? I didn't know how to write a book. Sometimes I'm not convinced I do yet. I just happen to have wonderful editors and publishers. But, yeah, when I, I had Lottie's story, um, I ended up writing it as a screenplay because I took the trouble to do some weekend courses and a few online courses on how to write a screenplay. Uh, a fabulous way to learn how to write, by the way. They come with a structure and with a set of rules, unlike a, a book. I couldn't find any rules. And even when I tried to learn them, I kept breaking them. You must write in the third person. You, know, you must write in the first person. What does that mean? Nothing to me. However, a screenplay, here's the rules, guys. You want it to be about two hours, one minute, one page of your screenplay, clear. Um, you must have this in the first 10 pages. You must have three acts only unless you're Quentin Tarantino. Do not break the rules. So that kind of structure was wonderful for me. And that's how I wrote Luddy's story. And that is what he read, many, many drafts of a screenplay. And uh, for him seeing them and flicking through the pages, seeing his name and Gita's name was just such a joy to watch him. And I hung on to it as a screenplay for probably way too long, or maybe the timing was just right. And uh, getting nowhere with it, and I was visiting my brother and sister-in-law in San Diego, who I was checking out with yesterday, trying to see how they were coping with what's currently happening in their country. And um, complaining about those sods 100 miles up the road in Hollywood who didn't know a decent story if it hit them over the head. When my sister-in-law just casually looked at me and went, oh, for goodness sake, write the bloody thing as a book and get on with it. Right. Okay, I'll give it a go. So that, that was how I decided to try and write it as a novel because I was getting nowhere with the screenplay. Uh, yeah, common sense tells me I never was because people don't know. I had never written a screenplay. Why would anybody want to read something I'd written? So, yeah, the novel came about and I was very, very lucky to get publishers straight away. In fact, the publishers found me. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Hmm. And now, Lale did want Brad Pitt to play him if it yeah. was going to be turned into a movie. Yep. He's a good-looking boy. I'm a good-looking boy. He would say to me, you give me Brad Pitt. And um, no, I had to tell him that Brad was too old to play him. Because here's the thing about these people. They were so young. You know, Silka was 16 and just turned 16. Um, you know, Lully was older, being in his early 20s, but we're still young and Brad's too old. Um, <laughs> but yes, but that just made it all the more wonderful as uh, Lully and I set about going to every new release movie for months. Oh, I think we may have just lost you there a bit, Heather. That's not what we want. Or have you lost me? Raise your hand if you can still hear me. Yep, okay. Well, Everything I'm... just closed down for me and I went, oh, no. <laughs> That's all right. I just keep talking. <laughs> That's right. You're right to go. Keep going. <laughs> That's all right. So um, I guess, you know, the, the $64 question, as they would say, well, it's probably more going to be like $64 million. But anyway, is uh, is there going to be a movie about uh, the Tattooist of Auschwitz? Uh, no, there's not going to be a feature film about it at all. But there is a six-part miniseries in development. And, and you, um, you talked about it being sold last time we spoke to you. Yeah. And then it all got um, buggered up, didn't it? And the filming that was meant to have been started in June in Poland, of course, never happened. And uh, but it's um, back on the on the greenlit table, shall we say? And as soon as you can get its act together, mm. gosh, yeah, stand by. <laughs> but it's good to go. Excellent. Now, tell me, what has been a career highlight for you? Traveling. I'm one of those silly people that is very happy to be sitting on a plane for 14 or 15 hours 
In fact, I even once took the trip from here to London via Perth, and that trip from Perth to London was 18 hours nonstop. And hey, I was in my element. I just kicked back and enjoyed it. Okay, okay, you're saying, yeah, 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 you travel at the front of the plane, so it's a damn sight more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm sorry about that, but that's the reality. But, it, look, I was just thinking, right now, this time last year, and I was reflecting on it two nights ago and I was talking to my publisher in London, I was in the US and I'd just come off a, a six- or seven-week tour in Europe, and um, right now I was, I think, either in Houston or LA tonight, 12 months ago. And all these amazing experience I've, I've had. And so I can't say one over the other because it's just collectively been incredible. And um, when it was last Saturday, for example, uh, Halloween. And I know last Halloween I was in Chicago. And when I was being driven to my event in the early evening, driving through the suburban part of Chicago, the snow was tumbling down. The whole place was white out. And the streets were just full of young boys and girls in their Halloween costumes, just like you see in the movies, walking around the streets. Yeah, it was a brilliant night, though it was snowing heavily. And, yeah, just a simple thing to have that memory of, of Chicago on Halloween night. I'd absolutely have to agree with you, except I have to do my travel in economy. But um, <laughs> yeah, but I must say I, I love it because it's always the anticipation of where you're going. Yeah. Um, that's I, I can't think of anything better. I, lo I love it. I well, it's a love combination it. of that and the fact that no one can find me for you know twenty four hours. Yep, <laughs> that's always good. Absolutely. Now, tell me, what do you do in your spare time? Um, look, I am a grandmother, and like a lot of other grandmothers right now, I have been denied my grandchildren in Brisbane. I have a flight booked on the tenth of January, a tenth of December. Okay, to go to Brisbane. And see my family there. And boy, if uh, that premier in there doesn't open up the borders, I'm going to be one cranky granny. Uh, I have three grandchildren here in Melbourne and they live not far from me. And um, no coppers there, is there? Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I have broken COVID rules more times than as probably I should be admitting to, so I can see them. But I'm, I'm practically writing my next book. I do a lot of talks like this. Because the book is in the curriculum in schools here in Australia and in the UK, uh, I spent a lot of time during the day doing Zoom talks into schools, mostly uh, in New South Wales for most of the last term because ours were shut, but also in the UK, talking to the students who, uh, who want to hear about Lali's story. And I'd love doing that, to know that uh, these younger people from 12 to, to 18, yes, a lot of time, in front of my little tiny lens there on my cam on my computer. Not my favourite way of talking to you, please. But. No. It's much nicer when we can get our book signed, I always say. Oh, absolutely. And, and, that, and that was really tough for me with stories because the book came out, what, three weeks ago? Is it that long ago? Maybe four? And it was only last Saturday that I got to go and walk into a bookshop, didn't I, and see it there. Absolutely. It's kind of weird as an author. That's one of the things, by the way, you apparently rush and do on day one. That's it. And you go and you sign a couple and just secretly sign them and walk out? <laughs> yeah. Well, the people down at my local, well, it's not my local, but my nearest um, shopping centre, which is Fountain Gate, mm. um, I'm in Berwick. And, uh, yeah, the people there at QBD and at Robinson's, uh, they all know me. So I walk in there and they're there. Wonderful. They're and I must... I must say, Robertson's are our bookseller. So I will say when we share this across social media, there will be a link for everyone to go and purchase Stories of Hope as well. Here's so. the thing. Only on Monday I shipped to Robinson's and Frankston because that's where their head office is. Mm -hmm. They sent to me, darling Robinson's, last week, 200 copies of the book that they'd purchased. And I said to Mara, send it to me here. So they sent it to my home. And I sat down and I signed the 200 and then rang them up and had the courier just come on Monday and take them away from me. So, yeah, Robinson's have got signed ones. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Because everyone here will now be jumping online after this to buy those signed copies. So thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> I did tell them you were coming. So they're pretty okay. good like that. Oh, now, I'm interested, I'm interested to know, you do have um, a story coming up mm -hmm. um, and you talk about it in Stories of Hope, the story of the three sisters. How is that coming along? Ah, she said reaching for a 
Well, there's one of Sibby's testimonies. What have I got here? Okay. Oh, that's Olivia's things. It's coming along. It's become more complicated than it probably should be. But yes, I tell um, a little, I've got a little tiny story of it in the back of stories. And that's just me whetting your appetite and what's well, the publishers really, isn't it? Let's face it. But uh, this is the story that I get to tell you because, well, I guess once again, I listened. Well, I started out by reading, being in a hotel in South Africa in June last year, two o'clock in the morning, I was in a wine region there called Franschuk. And I came back to my hotel room and I wasn't tired. I should have been. I'd had a few reds. Um, you're beginning to wonder about me, aren't you? No, I think well, about, I, just, I already knew we got along. Um, we get along even more now. <laughs> and how much has alcohol played a role in our lives in the last it, few months? I was going <laughs> to say we're on the Mornington Peninsula in Frankston anyway. Like we're surrounded by our wineries. True. But um, I read this amazing email that night. I just opened the one. There were several there. And it was from a man who, well, he lives in Toronto in Canada. And he said that he had picked up my book at Toronto Airport on his way to visit his mother in Tel Aviv. And luckily, Canada and Brazil are the only countries that have got the same cover as we do. Every other country's got something different, but Canada took our cover. Um, they rejected the one from uh, their parent company in New York, uh, which I thought was really interesting. But um, yeah, and so he took the book, the book, started reading it, got to his mum's, the next day he came out to finish reading it, put it down on her coffee table, and he's writing this in an email to me, and he said, and my mum walked past, looked down at the book and uttered the words, that must be about Lali and Gita. Will you read that at two o'clock in the morning with or without some red wine under your belt? And he subsequently told me that his mum recognised it because, A, she knew who the tattooist of Auschwitz was, but also the number on that book on Gita's arm, well, her number was three away from it. Her sister, Sibby, her older sister, is two away from Gita's, and she remembered Lully tattooing them. Now, I read that, and then I immediately responded. Within a couple of days, I'd moved from Franchok to Cape Town, and we'd had several emails, and this lovely lady had sent an email, I'd, re I'd love to talk to you. So I phoned her while I was in Cape Town and had a chat, and she said, there's so much I can tell you, so many stories that are not in your book, not only about Lully and Gita, but she won me over in that 10-minute phone conversation. A couple of days later, I'm, I get to Johannesburg and I write to my publishers in London. I said, look, read these emails. And I've had this conversation. I want to go to Israel. I need to meet this lady. And uh, Kate, my main publisher in London, read everything and rang me up in Johannesburg. And she said, yes, you can go to Israel. I said, right, well, I'm going home tomorrow to back to Melbourne. And I had to be in Europe in two weeks' time. And um, I sort of said, I'll try and squeeze it in sometime. And she said, yeah. She said, tomorrow morning, we're rerouting you from Johannesburg straight to Tel Aviv. I said, but Kate, I've run out of clean knickers. She said, well, learn to buy some or how to wash. I don't care, but you're going. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the next morning um, I arrived in Tel Aviv, not knowing the language, not knowing where the heck I was, not having any money. All I knew was the address of the hotel that I'd been booked into and the address of this lady, Livia. So the book is going to be simply called Three Sisters. We played around with long convoluted names and we've settled on three sisters. Mm. Livia, she was 15. She's 94 now and still alive in Tel Aviv. Magda, she was 17. She's 96 and is still alive in Tel Aviv. And Sibby, 19, she died a couple of years ago. Now, this is not just another Holocaust story, girl. So don't go thinking, oh, and guys, I can see Noel there. Hi, Noel. I'm going to be meaning to acknowledge you. Um, yes, they came from the same town as Gita. They went to school with Gita. They were on the train, train as Gita going to Auschwitz. They survived from April 1942 to January 1945. Three sisters surviving the Holocaust, virtually unheard of, I'm told by um, the, the academics. But it's not just their story in, in Auschwitz that I'm telling you, far from it. You'll hear that because well, both of these girls, particularly Livy and Sibby, they 
saw and were part of things that we are struggling to find documented anywhere else other than, and briefly, because the academics have not known really what happened in these circumstances. And I now have these girls who say, well, I was there, I can tell you what happened. Uh, historically significant elements. They have an escape from the death march that is worthy of a book itself. And that's a little snippet that you get in the back of stories, just one little vignette from that. Truly amazing how these girls, after three years of hell, starvation and illness, were able to escape and um, survive in the winter in Poland and Germany. But that wasn't the end of it. When they got back to Slovakia and then found themselves being rejected by the country of their birth, well, what did they do? Well, they joined with several other young Jewish boys and girls, or young adults by now, and uh, who had survived the Holocaust, and they went into the forest in Czechoslovakia. And there, over three months, they trained to become freedom fighters. Now, they were all given a gun because they were taught how to fight. And they were taught how to cook and how to do all manner of things, and then were smuggled all the way from... To, up in the Czech Republic part of the, the, the country through Slovakia, all communist ruled, had no checkpoints everywhere. And then they had to get into Romania and travel the whole length of Romania to get to the Black Sea, to get to Odessa. And there they boarded a ship and sailed to Palestine slash Israel. They were part of that young movement of Jewish boys and girls who established the state that we now call Israel. Wow. And their involvement there as these young people carving out a, a place in this new world was all that was now being thrown at them again. Again, it's truly amazing. That that's 15-year-old Livia, and she's the one I talk to the most. And I, I've been there now twice. I was back there again in January spending time with Livia and Magda. And now I have to get her with her daughter gets when I'm on the phone and I sat and you know, chat with her and she'll talk to me for about an hour and a half and prattle on. She's just beautiful. But um, yeah, this story is worth telling because again, young girls, survivors of multiple you know, events in history. And to think that this young girl at 15 not only survived the Holocaust, ultimately ended up in the home of the first ever president of Israel, yeah, President Wiseman. And uh, Mrs. Wiseman, his wife, who probably should have been the first president, an incredible woman, came to her wedding. And she even addressed the parliament of Israel when Golda Meir was prime minister. And she has this incredible untold story with the three girls too, the three sisters. Oh, I can't wait to read it and chat to you about it then. So oh, do we have any things? They all had families and I have met all their families and they're not only their they're adult children, they're adult grandchildren and they now have little tiny great-grandchildren and I'm part of their family and you know, Livia's uh, only daughter, she has a son and daughter, um, you know, call me their, their other sister. So much have I been embraced by these three families. It's just beautiful. Oh, it's wonderful. And I can't wait to ch chat to you about it then and have you back. Um, do we have some sort of time frame on that one? 17th of October next year it will be released. Yes, we do. Excellent. I will lock you in for that now. <laughs> now tell me, Heather, do you have any advice for aspiring authors who might be watching this tonight? You know, when I talk particularly to students who are there, because sometimes I'm not talking to um, history classes or English classes, but creative writing classes, because there seems to be... Um, the way I went about adapting a screenplay, because I found that an easy way to write, uh, into a novel is actually being taught, funnily enough, in screenwriting and in um, novel writing classes, not only in Australia, but uh, in the US in particular. They've kind of latched on to that because of that formula I talked about. And so particularly for students, I say to them, look, yeah, you'll, you'll be into movies. Everyone is at their age. And it is really quite a... It's a simple way to learn structure. And you can get down, you can download any movie ever made. Very easy to get. There's a whole lot of websites. You go on them. I think we've lost money again, but she'll pop No, no, up. no, I'm still here. All right. Just listening. Move? Okay. I see you're down the bottom now. She moved <laughs> right. Keeping you guessing. If you get, a screen, you get your hands on a screenplay of a movie you love, read it. 
then go and watch the movie and see the connect and sometimes the disconnect and then go back to the screenplay and just see how these two things work. Then you learn how story is told. Pick a good movie, you know, never mind the Marvel things, but pick a good movie like, you know, Chinatown or Witness. I say wit use wit the movie Witness because the, the person who wrote that and got the Academy Award from it is a friend of mine. Um, and so that is one way of learning it. Uh, look, the other way is, it's, you know, how do you become a champion gymnast? Or could it anything? you just got to keep practicing and trying and you don't give up. It, it really is as simple. There's no magic uh, way of doing it. But if you learn story and uh, how to tell story, and when you tell stories and you think about movies, more so in movies, but I put this in the way I write my books, is the importance of having what we call a change in the emotional arc of your story. You cannot write a comedy and have people laughing at every scene because after a while people will stop laughing. You need to change the emotion. You can't have a drama where the entire movie is just bad, 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 bad things. Even um, horror films, they will flip you out of the horror. They need to bring you out of that as a reader or a viewer. So learn about um, what emotional arcs are and how to go in and out of them to, to keep your, your reader or your viewer you know, engaged. So um, they're experts in how to teach how to writing. I'm not one of them. I just know what worked for me. Um, but it's just interesting that some aspects of what I did, which is you know, write the screenplay and adapt it now into a novel, is being taught as a way to do things. Wonderful. Now, what do you hope that readers take away when they read Stories of Hope? Yeah, I talk about, as you say, the, the, here's the sort of thing what the chapters are about, listening to your elders and uh, yeah, how too many people have probably stopped doing that because, hey, guess what? They've made more mistakes than you have and you don't have to learn from their mistakes. In fact, they don't want you to learn from them. You get to make your own. And, and listening to them, you can, we can all learn so much. And nobody, I never can, there's not one person alive who I could say is an ordinary person. And so many people say to, to me, including Livia and, and Tel Aviv, but I was just an ordinary girl. Yes, you, you might think you were, but you were living in a, through an extraordinary time in all of our lives. Right now, we are living in extraordinary times. And we have our own stories about surviving and our resilience now. So listening to your elders, listening to children, and I'm not just talking about little tackers. I'll give you a couple of little personal stories here about my grandchildren uh, not wanting to listen to each other and what happens when Miss Three-Year-Old just goes, no, no, not listening. Yeah, how to help um, get through that. But I, and as you know, Marnie, I talk about a very personal uh, event with my daughter where as an, an adult woman, a mother of three, I didn't listen to her. And I'm not talking about what she was saying, but I didn't listen to her body language and I didn't listen to what she wasn't saying in her life at a potentially um, a really, really uh, bad time. Yeah, this was, she was a young mum with a, a newborn and two other toddlers and didn't pick up on the postnatal depression that, that she was clearly exhibiting. Well, we did when it, she finally let us know. I'm talking about us by being her husband and me. But here's the, here's the other biggie, guys. This is the biggie I want you to take away. And it's when I write to you about listening to yourself. And you don't even know that you, you can do that half the time and how important it is and how to stop listening to that thing in your head that more often than not is, may not be saying nice things about your own self. Um, and if you take the time to just pause and, and listen to your head, listen to your heart, and listen to your body. My body, it's always telling me, hey, listen, girl, get off that ass of yours and move it, move it. Do I always listen to it? No, I don't. But um, every now and then I do because I, I, I listen to it and I hear it. Uh, and to me, I give you a few sort of tips on how to do that because I think that is probably the most important thing that I think I want you to take away from this book, and that's to how to listen and look after yourself. It seems weird. I'm not into the self-help. This is not about mindfulness and 
there, there are words about it now. Yeah, like mindfulness is the word that gets bandied around. And um, I have never read a book on mindfulness. Uh, I don't fully understand what it is because I've never tried to understand it. I just know that if I take the time and listen to myself every now and then, I feel better for it. So... Uh, what, else do I write? what else do I write in that book, Marnie? Well, you, you know, the bit I actually took away from it was, you know, if you do have children or children in your life, um, listen to the small stuff, otherwise yeah. they won't tell you the big stuff. And as the mum of a daughter turning six on Saturday, that's probably, other than the listen to your gut, um, that's probably the number one thing I took away. And at the moment it's mum, mum, mum. And I was yeah. like, What? But since I read your book, I've actually taken the time to step back. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, what can I help you with? And just listen to the little stories so that I know when things are happening or if something horrible did happen to her, she knows I'll listen. Well, it's not only that. That little story that you think it's a little story, it's actually a big story for her. Absolutely. And if you don't listen to her when she tells you her big little stories when she's little, why would she want to tell them to you when she's a teenager when you want them to tell you? <laughs> well, I remember saying to my own mum, she said, oh, I don't want to hear this. And I said, you can either hear it all or nothing. And she's like, I'll go for all. Just tell me all. Okay. Because I'm an oversharer. So uh -huh. she's, like, she's like, tell me everything. I'd rather you tell me everything than tell me nothing at all. And I was like, that's right. You don't get to pick and choose what I tell you. Look, that's fantastic. And, uh, yeah, and that's what I've been hearing from, well, actually a lot of journalists. Have, I've done a lot of publicity into the UK uh, there. Every television, radio station and network from Scotland to Wales and Ireland and in between and every major newspaper and magazine. And talking to some of these uh, journalists, it's interesting, the young ones, the ones who have got young children in their lives, they're saying, thank you. I have read the bit about listening to your children and I had no idea how little I actually listened to them. It certainly threw a spotlight on it for me. Good to hear. Excellent. Now tell me, Heather, where can people find you online? Um, up there's the website yourstoriesofhope.com. Yeah, I think that's all there is. And I have a website. I think it's Heather Morris Author. I must talk to um, yeah, the person, namely number one son, who, who manages that. I think it's kept up to date mostly. But, yeah, they're all got sort of screwed up with because in there they list where I'm talking and where I'm going, and that's all been screwed up with a little bit. But um, I know tomorrow night I'm talking into Cape Town Radio for an hour, so Ooh. Um, that's always fun. And you're quite active on Instagram as well. Yeah, I am actually. Um, I'm, I, I read it and I look at it. Uh, can I honestly tell you that I wouldn't know how to put a thing on Instagram if you paid me? <laughs> you have to let other people do that for me. Purely because um, th there's just not enough time in the day to look at that. But I do go and look at the what people post there for me and I read that and I comment on that. But I, I don't know how to do anything myself. I can attest to the fact that... And I won't touch Twitter. I was too scared that that... You know, no. I might tap into Trump or something by accident. And No. I'm very much, as, as a PR person, I'm very much stick to the stick to the sites and the social media channels that you're comfortable with. Yeah. Because if and you do that, you can't go wrong. Yeah. Uh, and I have a public Facebook page, which uh, every fortnight, I think, or I dropped it down to three weeks now, I actually do on a Monday night a live uh, event. So I come on live and I just chat and talk uh, about, uh, sometimes I'll have a theme running, other times I'll just, yeah, chat like I am now. But um, I did seem to get, because that's live Facebook live all around the world and Absolutely. It's amazing. I have all these comments that are coming through while I'm talking and they're coming from Italy and Hungary and, and the UK and all over the States. It's, it's really quite wonderful. Now, yeah. Heather, do you know, can you remember what your handle is on Instagram? We've just got some, somebody mm -hmm. asking. I think it might be at Heather Morris author. Uh, Possibly. Uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm just trying Don't to... Come on, us. We're just, <laughs> we're just checking Instagram. Give me a clue. Are you Heather Morris Orsa? That's about the best I can tell you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was it, so... Okay, that'll do. I tag you in stuff, so I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Heather, we have run out of time. Um, but thank you. Back. 
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, what's this? Uh, are all the Robertson's books signed by Heather? It won't be everything that Robertson stocked, but Heather has signed a lot of them. So perhaps either drop into the shop or give them a buzz um, for your online order. So, thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah. um, hi, Noel. I recognise you. How are you doing? And Beck has let us know that it is Heather Morris author. Oh, thank but, you. Perfect. Thanks, okay. Beck. Somebody knows more than me and not unusual. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Heather. It's been an absolute okay. pleasure. All right. 12 months time in person, okay? Done. Done. I will hold you to that. Now, I'll do my official close off now and then we can have a little chat. But Heather's novels are available to borrow. <laughs> Thanks, Beck. Uh, Heather's, Heather's novels are available to borrow via our online library, which you can access for free with your Franks and City Libraries membership via our website. If you're not a member, you can sign up via our website straight away. You can also pop the physical book on reserve because we will reopen on Monday. Yay. So that's very exciting. Uh, you can also purchase Stories of Hope and all of Heather's novels from Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston. We'll also include the link when we share this uh, recording across our social media channels. Now, keep an eye on the Frankston City Library's website for the great Frank talks we have coming up, including General Sir Peter Cosgrove, who'll be chatting with me on Monday night. I know, Heather, I'm so excited. Um, I was just yeah, as excited sure. for you, by the way. <laughs> and voice of the Outback, Fleur McDonald. So thank you so much for joining us for today's Frank Talk with Heather Morris for Frankston City Library. Mm -hmm.